But at the time being, the onus is on public companies to sort of figure out how AI is impacting their operations, their businesses, how they're using it, and assessing whether for purposes of the disclosure they need to say something about it. All right, let's take ourselves to the AI chat room. Very this cool. Is, this is our home base where we start these conversations. Uh, we're talking today about the SEC and artificial intelligence. Eric, why don't we start with you and just tell the audience a little bit about your background. So I do come from over 10 years at the SEC, so I know a little bit about the inner workings of the agency, uh, but I basically, my practice is public company advisory. I work with companies that um, uh, are currently public or companies that want to go public, and obviously um, AI is in everybody's mind. And Brent, tell us about your background. A lot of my practice is working with public companies, most of which are technology companies, on all matters of SEC reporting, corporate governance, capital markets, M&A, and you know, I, I can tell you, they're thinking about these issues. They're grappling with AI. How does it impact their company, the environment in which they operate? So is the SEC thinking about artificial intelligence? So, um, fun fact, when I was at the SEC, I basically um, was in charge of the finance group that you know started to review all the crypto filings back in the day. And I have to tell you, nobody was really prepared for crypto. So I don't know how prepared they are for artificial intelligence, even though I would say that the commission has been using basically data reading machines for purposes of figuring out how registrants are complying with their SEC rules and regulations. I do have to say that the current chairman is somebody that seemed to be really on top of technology, whether it's blockchain, whether it's AI. But at the time being, the onus is on public companies to sort of figure out how AI is impacting their operations, their businesses, how they're using it, and assessing whether for purposes of the disclosure they need to say something about it. So one of the things I love about you guys together here, your practice spans from early stage emerging companies all the way to established public companies. Uh, along that spectrum, what do companies need to know about AI? The problems and the risks, the opportunities, they're all kind of the same in some respects. Like the larger the company, the more regulated they are, being in the public markets, you have other people looking over your shoulders. But the kind of decisions that we're hearing from clients, the kind of things that they are concerned about, there's no real distinction between public and private. You have engineers saying, I want to write code using generative AI. Right? Well, there's some opportunities there. There's efficiency gains, you can come from it, but there's risks that are created, right? There's risks that that same generative AI can then decompile your code and you know, use it by cyber criminals to attack you. Right? There's risks of your confidential information ending up in the public domain. Those risks exist whether you are public or private. The difference for the public companies is you now have this regulatory environment. You have a wide swath of investors, and you need to talk about those risks in a public manner in a way that maybe a private company doesn't. You need to have controls around your environment in a way that maybe a you know, private company doesn't. But the decisions, the impacts, how does AI work its way into your business, those are universal, I think, for companies right now. It's no secret that the capital markets in the last couple of years have been a little bit tepid. So when you've got companies where their business is an AI-driven business, it's very exciting. It creates opportunity. You're sort of redefining a particular space in a different way by using this very advanced technology. But again, it's a little trickier for public companies because they have this overlay of regulations that they have to think so many steps ahead before implementing something and how that is going to be also disclosed in a way that it is understandable for the investing public. And one of the things that the SEC does not like and doesn't help actually the investors with their investment making decision is to see what we call boilerplate disclosure. Basically the same risk factor is going to pop up in so many different filings and an investor has a very hard time discerning, well, how does it really apply to you as opposed to somebody else in a different industry, even though you have the same wording? Well, and it's a great point because a lot of the risk frameworks that are coming out make the same argument that every company is different in the way they adopt AI, and the risk profile and the risk benefit for that company are extremely different. How common is boilerplate, and, and how do you get clients past that with something as particular as AI? So the standard is should not be boilerplate. <laughs> Actually, in the last few years, the SEC did change the rules to sort of force the companies to really discuss the risk 
from a materiality perspective as it relates to their business. And they even created a second category of risk where you have general risk at the end of you know, the risk factor section. And companies don't like that. So they try desperately to customize them as best as possible. So part of our job is to really sort of be a sounding board for the companies, canvas the market, see what's going on you know, based on what their competitors are doing or how the markets are shifting in order to make it company specific because it's also like a free insurance we call it for public companies. Eric made a great point there, which is the way a lot of companies think about this is as insurance. You would rather have said that risk was a risk before it happens versus after. And so the natural inclination is well, throw the whole kitchen sink, Dr- right? Dr- Every Dr- single <laughs> bad thing, anything under the sun that could happen that is bad. Let's yeah. put it in there because if it happens, we'd rather have said it was there because the SEC won't come calling, shareholders won't come calling. So as counsel, right, our, our job is to ask questions. How can we tweak this to be specific to your business, how you're using AI, right? Not just AI in general. And then the other thing is the SEC, and Aaron knows this better than anybody else, are really focused on hypothetical risks that aren't actually hypothetical. And by that, what I mean is companies will say, there is a risk that this bad thing could happen, but it already has happened. You you see it in the cybersecurity context all the time, where there's a risk that we could be breached by third parties when they have been breached. And the SEC is really focused on those kind of disclosures and are taking it sort of through the lens of, that was misleading, right? You told people it was hypothetical, but it was a real risk. If you said that there's a risk of bias, but you knew that there was bias in the AI that you were incorporating into your products, that's a problem. So it is always good practice to scrub through your risk factors, as we call the companies. Never copy and paste your risk factors from your last 10K to the next 10K or worse, from another company. That's a good lesson for first-year lawyers, too. (laughs) Careful with those templates. (laughs) What should companies be doing with AI where it's a very uncertain new technology? So so there's a number of concepts at play here. So the concept of materiality, is the information important that will make a difference in how an investor will decide to buy or sell shares in the market? So to the extent that something, you know, whether the company is thinking about it, is implementing it, is in the early stages, it goes into sort of the whole, this, you know, idea of is it material to the enterprise as a whole? Or is it material at time to something that strategically the company believes is very important to them? And we have to run the, that, through that analysis a lot of time with our clients. And at times it's actually, you know, not necessarily a science, it's a little bit of an art because sometimes you have to run what's called a qualitative analysis and maybe may sort of material in either end. And the other, I would say the other principle, there is a number of principles at play, is how probable it is in terms of, yes, we have embarked in this journey, we are really thinking about it, we're gonna maybe roll out this new technology, but we're gonna start small. And yes, there may be a risk, but how probable it is for that risk to sort of happen in the foreseeable future, whether it is in the next 12 months or so, that is unknown. Therefore, that's how the companies are thinking from the risk perspective. And then, you know, the other thing that you need to think about is, um, have you been a good corporate citizen at the end of the day? Has the SEC come knocking on your door more often than you probably would have liked? So you may have a higher risk profile, you know, in the eyes of the regulator. So you might want everything in terms of how aggressive you are in taking certain risks and not necessarily communicating that to the to the public. Let me pull on that just a little bit, Eric, because we definitely see from the AI data science and liability side that there are certain companies that just become the bad guys Mm -hmm. and and they're constantly, for everybody else, does that give you more room to take risks? Does it change your approach? So it's very interesting because, you know, as a former regulator, I have to sort of fight against this misconception of like, oh, you're too conservative, you have to be more commercial. And I actually would say that I'm completely the opposite because I really understand sort of, you know, how the regula- regulator thinks from a risk perspective. I do think that this is, that is an element that somebody needs to think about. Every company has a certain culture, has certain principle, and they run a business different ways. And, you know, the rule breaker sometimes may not necessarily be rewarded, as we've seen a lot with, you know, I bring crypto again, but that's where we've seen, you know, a lot of demise, a lot of investor money sort of, you know, going to waste. So I do think that there is a little bit of, you know, narrow lens when it comes to, you know, perpetrators that keep to sort of, you know, push the boundaries of compliance. Have we gotten to the point in the last year where AI governance is an expectation for public companies? Obviously the board has a duty to oversee risk 
enterprise-wide, and they need to ensure that there is a framework in place in order to sort of control or at least has a sense of, you know, what the risks are, and that's how they, they work with, with management in order to have the system in place to sort of reduce the risk. So I think that there is no sort of, you know, one-size-fits-all. Um, every company needs to sort of understand their fundamental risk profile. And then on top of it, you have also the disclosure controls and procedures in place. Companies need to be educated enough or to talk to the three of us at this table to really understand necessarily what the next step is from a legal risk perspective. When you hit on something really important there, I think, which is the way that the SEC looks at it. I mean, AI, everything, right? Every new technology has opportunities and it has risks. A regulator, the SEC, no different than any others, is largely going to look at it through that risk lens. In your work with boards, uh, what are they asking about AI? What do they need to know about AI? For companies and for boards in particular, they're tasked with overseeing the enterprise risk management of the company, right? And that includes risk and includes opportunities. And so when it comes to AI, it does depend on the company. But if you're a board of you know, directors, right, you're a board member, your question to management should be, how are you thinking about AI, both in terms of our business, right? How are you incorporating it? What risk does that create for us? And how do you think about it in terms of our environment? Are our competitors adopting AI and we're not, right? Are we creating risks to our business by not being on the vanguard? Or by the way, are we spending so much on AI for an opportunity that may or may not exist for our business? And so those kind of discussions, right? It's management's job to run the business. It's the board's job to oversee management, but to be able to be informed enough to ask the right kinds of questions. Like when you talk about cybersecurity, board members don't all have to be cybersecurity experts, but they need to know enough to ask the right kind of questions of management, to pressure test the things that management's reporting out. I, I view AI in a similar way. They need to be able to ask those questions and management should be able to report out to the board on, on what they're doing, what they're doing with your team, right? To help create governance around this. So is it a board level issue? It, it's a categorical board level issue. Is it a board level issue for every single company? Well, it depends on the company. Even though I would say that, you know, you don't even know whether employees are using AI as part of their, you know, day to day. And public companies have to have some controls around what the employees are doing. So boards need to understand, you know, does the company even have any policies in place around, you know, employee use without even sort of going into sort of the enterprise-wide, you know, use of AI, just like social media. Companies had to sort of put controls around, you know, employees' use of social media, and the same thing goes for AI, I think. It was such a good point. One of the things I've noticed talking to a lot of companies is they don't even have oftentimes an inventory of how AI is, is being used. And if it's employees on, on chatbots or if it's research and development or, or manufacturing and supply chain or, or even uh, consumer-facing uh, interactions, those all have very different risks and risk profiles. They're all great potential uses of AI. But to your point, how can you make the right disclosures or, or set the right controls when you haven't yet gone through the process of, of figuring out what are we already doing. And so when you talk about AI and the risk, not knowing what your employees are doing, not knowing how AI is sort of making its way through your business, that in and of itself is something that a regulator would have a problem with. And, and that's a great point because you don't even know what vulnerabilities it may create, especially in the cyber security space. So looking back at your experience, how do you see SEC approaching AI and, and what should companies be anticipating? I think we talked about this, very risk adverse. So they will think of the absolute worst case scenario and always they have the benefit of the hindsight being 2020. So one thing that we do as we talk to the clients or advise them through this process of, you know, whether building an AI governance or whether, you know, basically thinking of AI from a strategic point of view, from a competitive point of view, is that you have to talk to everybody that will give you a very wholesome view of the risks and whether it is the SEC form reinforcement SEC lawyer, whether it's the SEC disclosure lawyer, the cyber lawyer, the AI governance lawyer, the corporate lawyer, I think that it's very important to take an absolute 360 holistic view in deciding to make those very big decisions on moving towards adoption of AI. So what makes you most optimistic about AI? It's funny, we've talked so much about risk, which makes sense given the nature of the, the panel, right? But there's so much opportunity set when it comes to AI, generative AI or otherwise, right? And so what I'm excited about is companies that are looking to harness that, whether they're category creators, right? They are using it to drive efficiencies in their business to get ahead of their competition. There's going to be waves of winners in this, right? And there's obviously going to be people who chase something and don't doesn't work out for them. But 
from a, an advisor perspective, it's exciting to see companies have an opportunity set in front of them. From a regulator and you know, SEC lawyer perspective, you always want to make sure you temper when you talk about the opportunity that's supportable, that you're not you know, hyping things too much. But that opportunity set is really, really exciting. Um, I think it's a bit unprecedented where the legislators are coming together with sort of, you know, like the people, the big tech, and they understand the power of this technology. And I think that what we need, what remains to be seen is, you know, what regulatory developments are going to come, you know, down the pike and how these companies are developing will have to adjust and pivot in order to come within compliance. But it's a rapidly moving Absolutely. area. The, the, maybe the biggest lesson, right, is just be nimble. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. I mean, the, the, the thing that comes across to me hearing you talk is judgment. And I love that it comes out of the interdisciplinary approach we have, but whether it's tech innovator startups in, in Austin or going through IPO or it's fully mature public companies, there's no boilerplate here. There, there's no established set of rules yet uh, for this technology, but people can't wait. And so you guys are bringing your judgment to bear and, and your technical knowledge to help companies get the right disclosures and the right controls. And uh, working together with you guys on this has just been really exciting. Really appreciate you taking time today to meet with us. This is a lot of fun. Thank you for having yeah. us. This is great. Loved it. Yeah. <laughs>